welcome to the MMA Fan Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Stu and Blake. How are you doing, Paddy? I'm, I'm brilliant, lad. Good, good, well, good. My weight's nice, nice and low, lad, so I've got nothing to stress about at the minute, lad. Uh, like I say, it's, I'm happy days at the minute. As you can tell, I'm nice and I'm looking skinny. Lovely, lovely. lovely. Well, Paddy, we're recording this on um, Mother's Day, and this is coming after two weekends of controversial stoppages due to knees in the UFC. And I know that um, you you chimed in on, on, on our social media about um, Jans last week. And yeah. What I just want to sort of ask you really is, you know, as, as Blake and I have, have never stepped foot in, a, in an octagon, we are armchair fans. And th- there was a lot of controversy around um, Jans' corner saying that they were saying knee. Um, and obviously the, 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 the Darren Stewart one didn't appear to be like that. I just want to ask you, A, what your thoughts were on, on both of those incidents and, and just the relationship with your, with your corner and how much of what they say during the fight is getting through to you and what you can hear and how much of it are you just lost in the fight? Well, to be honest, when it comes to the corner, I, I have a few voices what do stand out. Know what I mean? Like my coach Paul Rimmer, Ella Sampson, Adam Ventry, uh, Chris Williams, know what I mean? Like all them there, like people who are generally in my corner and their voices do stick out from a crowd, know what I mean? Then I always hear my me, me girlfriend, come on, Paddy, and my dad, <laughs> come on, Patrick, know what I mean? I know because it's Patrick, but um, yeah, so when you hear instructions like that from the voices, what you know, especially when there's no crowd, you're going to do what they say, like. I can't speak Russian, so I don't know. I don't know what PT on the corner said. I heard Khabib come out and said that he said to me, um, in that position, I think Jan was very stupid to throw a knee when he could have just continuously punched. It did look like Sterling was looking for him to do that though. He was in a he was going into like a fetal position and just getting down in that position. It, it was a bit strange. I don't like the way Sterling jumped on the floor. Like he could have won a Razzie for that. Serious. That was some bad act, and that. Don't care what anyone says. He was. Um, I've seen people take clean shots to the head and jump up quicker than that. That was a. Uh, that was embarrassing for me to be honest. The uh, like I, I compared him to Neymar. What Neymar does when he jumps on the floor and rolls round when he hardly gets kicked just to get another player book. Uh, and the fact that he said after it, I don't want to take the belt like this. And then there's pictures of him everywhere with his hands up saying. And now he's saying Peter Yan doesn't deserve a rematch. I've never heard nothing like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I, I, I thought that the moment where I stopped feeling sorry for him was was when I saw the pictures of him with the belt. And you're like, because I felt like the way he dealt with it in the cage was brilliant. The way he threw down the belt, he, you know, he, he said he didn't want to win the belt that way. It's not his fault that he got kneed in the head. Um, and also, I think that I, I hate even with the the Darren Stewart one last night, I, I'm not a fan of the onus being on the fighter to continue or not. I think if you've suffered an illegal blow, especially like a knee to the head, whether it's slightly blocked or whether it's kind of half knocked you out or not, I think that's a ref and a doctor's decision. Yeah. And it, it, putting the pressure on the fighter, you get moments like Anthony Smith, who was lauded for being a bit of a warrior or whatever. But as we've heard, you know, being a warrior doesn't necessarily pay your mortgage when you then go back home. And, you know, Sterling now, rightly or wrongly, he's going to be on the pay-per-view points. He absolutely should be rematching Jan. But he's he, he, there's an argument to be said that, like, well, in a way he's done the right thing in terms of I've been illegally here. It will have an impact on the fight and I'm now just going to go away and we'll have to do it again because you, the champion fucked up. I think in that situation when a belt is changing hands, it's you can DQ them, but the belt should become vacant. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it should be like, I know it sounds stupid, but wrestling. (laughs) Yeah. In WWE, you can't win a belt off a DQ and that's, Fake, know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't yeah. think you should be able to win a belt off a DQ unless it is absolutely like intentional. Like, it should go to the yeah. scorecards if anything. 
should go yeah. to the scorecard and see what the scorecards were at that point. Because in my eyes and my view, Peter Yan was four rounds up. I don't see how Sterling won a single round of that fight. Well, that's another interesting thing that happened last night, which I, I mean, I I don't know enough to know exactly why this is. I've heard a couple of things, but the Darren Stewart one, Stewart one last night, that wasn't a DQ. That was a no contest. And they're saying, oh, well, it was in round one. So you don't necessarily go to the scorecards or something like that. But then I've heard other people say, well, no, obviously, if you do something illegal and it looks intentional, that is a disqualification. But how can you throw a knee unintentionally? Like, like Eric Anders threw that knee. All right, he didn't intend for it to be an illegal shot, but Peter Yarn didn't intend for it to be an illegal shot. They exactly. both seem to make mistakes. So, I mean, I don't know if you know or if you have an opinion on it. Why is one okay to be a disqualification and one a no contest? It's just the ref's discretion. As far as yeah. I'm aware, it's the ref's discretion. And here being saw that one as a no contest. And I think because last week that the referee did say to Yarn, he's a damned opponent. Mm. Don't throw it. I think that's what made him DQ him. And then with the one last night, Herb never said nothing like that. So he just threw the knee and it got called a no contest because he never got prior warning towards it. But I, I'm I'm all for them sort of knees. Yeah. I, I, like putting your hand down and you need that. I'm all for that. Like pride rules. I'd love to fight pride rules, lad. So I think I've heard you. I, I was about to say. I think I've heard you say in an interview before. You quite enjoy the idea of doing a soccer kick. Yeah, I, I, I'd love that, lad. Like it, be, it wouldn't be nice to be on the the end of the one, but throwing no. them would be be good. Know what I mean? I used to love watching pride fights, and yeah. they're a bit before my time. Know what I mean? I never, I never really like got to watch any pride pride events live. But from what I've watched, lad, the the more entertaining than a lot of UFC fights are. Yeah, well, I heard. I think Demetrius Johnson came out and said uh, that basically agrees with everything you just said. That that you you should be al- able to knee a downed opponent. I think you can do that in one championship as well. You can, yeah, you can. Yeah. You can knee to the head in one championship. That's what he's getting at. Because yeah. um, like it, it's it's half a stall. Like what what uh, for me what Stalin was doing. He was stalling. Mm. He was stalling in that position. Like he didn't want to. He didn't want to stand back up because Jan was getting the best of the strike and, and he didn't want to keep going for the takedown because he was gassing himself out, going for the takedown all the time and failing. So he was just going to that position to stall. He was putting his hand down or putting his knee down. Yeah. And a lot of people use that rule to not get need. I've done it myself when I got yeah. shot in for the takedown and I haven't got it. I've just put my hand on the floor knowing full well that the opponent can't beat me in the head. It is half a stalling tactic and yeah. I, I think it should be took out the game. You know what I mean? We also saw uh, a, a, another just awful end to a fight last night, obviously with Leon Edwards. Um, and I just want to ask you as well, in regards to sort of eye pokes, um, obviously um, Leon got warned last night already not to do it. Um, and then obviously, I'm not saying it was intentional at all, um, but not never have putting on uh, a pair of MMA gloves before. How easy are things like this to happen? Because, we, you know, we, we do see it on, on most cards. There, there'll be a, not necessarily a stoppage, but there'll be somebody will get an eye poke. Like, is it the different organisations, gloves have different impact on, on how your fingers are? And, and I just want to get your kind of take on it, really, Paddy. I've I seen, um, I seen, I think, Lewis Smolker putting on Twitter that he'd like to change the seven ounce gloves because it'd have more padding, but I, I think that's quite stupid. It would it's completely changes the sport then. Doubling the ounce in the gloves just over fingers. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I wouldn't do that. We need to stick to four ounces. If there's another way that we can modify the gloves so that that doesn't happen, then yeah, I'm all for it. But we can't be changing the size of the gloves because of a, a few eye pokes. You know what I mean? There, yeah. there is a, like, that long last night was terrible. Um, oh. But he didn't mean it. You know what I mean? It was an honest mistake. He, he, that's what you do. You stick your hand out to throw a kick. That that's what people do. Um, he didn't expect Balal Muhammad to come in so close when he's done that. It, it comes from because obviously most of the time when we spar, we wear boxing gloves. Nobody spars in four ounces. You know what I mean? And then if we do spar in um, in like eight ounces with the fingers out, nine times out of ten you're wearing head guards because of head clashes and stuff like that. So it doesn't really happen in training. It just happens in fights. And there's, there's, there's nothing you can do about it, I think, personally, because people are always going to do that to gauge the range. 
you're yeah. always going to stick your hand out. I, I do it. Everyone does it. It's just nowadays, like obviously, as what happened last night, you don't you get told not to do that, and you get told to do that. Yeah. So your fingers are pointing in the in the sky, but there's when someone steps in as you stick your hand out, there's not much you can do about that. So mm. it, like people saying that we need bigger gloves and stuff like that, I don't agree with. If there's a good modification that we can do to the gloves, then yeah, I'm all for it. But at the minute, it's just it's literally human error. You you can't. It's just like getting kicked in the balls. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? People get kicked in the balls. Like every every show, at least one or two fights, there's a few groin shots, yeah. stuff like that. Same with punches to the back of the head. Um, Hasgrat uh, uh, moaned yeah. at one point over getting punched in the back of the head on the feet, but it was because he'd turned and then got it in the back of the head. Th- yeah. There's nothing you can do about stuff like that. I, 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 I don't see like what we can do about it, to be honest. Because we're not going to wear boxing gloves because then we can't grapple properly and effectively. Yeah, I, I know Trevor Whitman was on Joe Rogan with Justin Gaethje a while back and he's designed his own MMA gloves apparently and he's hoping that the UFC picks them up. I don't know exactly what the differences are. I'd have to research it and stuff and people can go away and do that. But um, yeah, there's definitely something where Joe Rogan basically said, these are the best things I've ever seen and I don't know why they're not in circulation at the moment. And I think Trevor Whitman's had offers to have them in... Uh, other organizations but I think his idea is well I want them to be in the UFC first because then that kind of really legitimizes the glove as like the best glove or something so uh, so I think he's waiting on that deal but but that hopefully there might be some kind of change out there that keeps it four ounce and benefits everyone and saves the eyes and all that stuff in the future well even more so now after what happened last night because that is one of the worst ones I've ever seen mm. Um, yeah. like that was terrible last night but it was completely unintentional after last night they might take Trevor Whitman up on his offer and have a look at them Trevor Whitman's a, a pioneer of the sport you know what I mean they have him talking on most UFC events so it wouldn't surprise me if they did try and bring that in to be honest yep hearing a fighter crying instantly like that and then look up and he's crying blood I mean that was oh, pretty God. fucking horrific wasn't it it was like I watched it this afternoon and was just like, oh, I, I would hate for that to happen to me because, like, there's all the heart. Like, I felt sorry for Leon. I know he didn't get poked in the yeah, eye. Me too. But he's been, he's been out for over 600 days and then he finally gets in there. No one will fight him. He finally gets in there with someone. He has a perfect first round. He looked great. It he looked really looked good. Boss, yeah. Had a perfect first round and then he throws a body kick in the second round and as he puts his hand out for um, for his range it goes in the opponent's eye and the opponent can't continue oh, I, I felt so bad for Leon there to be honest Yeah, I mean you spoke about him being out for so long I know when we spoke briefly before Blake you was quite interested in asking Paddy about the kind of time outside and stuff yeah well obviously you had your your hand injury, you've had surgery and stuff. And I remember I, yeah. I, I saw, like, I think Cage Warriors did a, a, a fantastic uh, kind of short, like, documentary on, on, like, your timeout and gearing up towards a fight. I think it might have been towards your, the, the fight that, was it Joe? Like that never Human, happened. The fight that never happened, yeah, which we can get on to later. But yeah. what I, um, what fascinates me about fighters, I think they're just so mentally strong. And what you, what you go through in the lead up to the cage, whether it be, like, the weight cuts and preparing to to fight in general as someone that's, you know, I've never been great with confrontation. So I look at fighters and I go, wow, how do you, how do you do that by choice? And um, I just think, how, how, how do you get through these times where you're like, I, the thing that I love to do, I'm not allowed to do right now. I literally know my, my body or the doctors, whatever it is, they're telling me I can't do it. How do you go through that period of time? Cause I'm assuming that was a difficult time to get through. It's the worst. Because obviously mentally you you just want to do it, you yeah. want to do it so much, lad. You want to train. Like I've I've been through p- months, like periods where it's been months where I couldn't train because my hands are that bad. Like I've had three hand surgeries now, oh. two on my right hand and one on my left hand. And um, like I've went into I went when I fought Soren back, I went into that fight with a broken hand, three months post surgery. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. my hand was still absolutely cabbaged. Even the last fight with Decky Dalton, I never got my hand looked at before I fought. But when I got my hand looked at two months later, I got told I had ligament damage and needed surgery again. So I went into that fight with a fucked up hand. But um, after I fought back, I was at the lowest of the low. You know what I mean? I fought back, obviously, 
I lost that fight and I come so close to winning it in the first round. But as you as you know, my hand was cabbage. So yeah. when I was squeezing the choke, I couldn't get the full squeeze on it. And then come out for the second, third, fourth round. And as the fight went on, my arms just died. And uh, the months after that, lad, I just like I was crying every morning when I woke up. My bed had my bed had get up out, out of bed, go to work, give me a kiss, burn, and I and I'd just cry my eyes out in my in my room. Just like ah, oh, that really happens to me. Like uh, how can you be that unlucky? You know what I mean? And then I had to wait months to get surgery again on that hand. And then finally, as you know, I was gearing up to fight. And then I, I that was another wake up. What's like this one now? Everything went perfect. Everything was brilliant. I went into that fight feeling as fit as, as I've ever felt and more prepared than I've, I've ever felt. And my opponent weighed in 11 pounds heavier than me. And I saw, I saw, I think I saw you had a bit of an altercation because he had two hours to then go and cut that extra weight. Yeah, and he didn't even seem to try, did he? He just sat down. No, did he, he sit down and try. eat a chocolate bar or something like that? Or I might be making down. it up. He sat down, started eating a brownie. Fucking hell! Drinking water. Yeah. He weighed. He weighed in at what did he weigh in? Because I weighed in at one fifty four point seven. I weighed in under, and he weighed in at once one sixty four point nine or something. So we weighed in like eleven pounds heavier than me, ten pounds over the weight limit, and we literally said to him, "Go and make." 160 like I've made 150 foot 154 points on go and make 160 and the fight's on you know what I mean the fight's still on go and make 160 and he just sat down started drinking water and eating something and my, my corner man Adam went straight over to him and what are you doing and his coach went well, why are you going to make him stop eating and he was like well, I'm not going to make him stop eating lad but the fight's off then isn't it you fucking idiot yeah, and then he was like yeah. yeah exactly and then he started shouting like the worst thing about that was, lad, he was blatantly lying because he said, I've fainted three times in the sauna. That's what he said. And then as soon as, obviously, I said, what are you doing, drinking? He's jumped up on his toes and me like, what, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I just went, that's not a man who's just fainted three times. Yeah. At all. You wouldn't have that much energy because I've fainted doing a wake up before. And like, I had one eye looking this way and one eye looking that way. Yeah. And like, like looked terrible. Looked like I'd just come out of a prisoner of war camp. And like you've got him him sitting there arguing the toss, shouting back and forth. I was like, we all know everyone in this room knows that you have not done that much weight. And you just like what he was saying was um no one else will fight you, will he? No one else will fight you. Take the fight then, take the fight. So that's what the the reason that never ended up happening was because he done that strategically. Yeah. He, he he knew we weren't going to make weight, so we thought, yeah, I'll just come in heavy, and because no one else will fight him, he'll take the fight. And uh, in the end, it wasn't even my decision. Again, another time, I was crying my eyes out because I got the phone call off my coach and my manager, and they both just said, listen, we're not letting you take this fight. It's your first fight back in over a year, and we're not letting you take a fight against someone who's missing weight by that much. So again, I was back in the hotel room crying my eyes out, just like I'm not fighting again. What the fuck? That absolutely sucks, man. How, how do you? Because obviously, like we're in the middle of. Well, hopefully it's not the middle. Hopefully it's like towards the end of it. But uh, you know, the pandemic's been going on a year now, and loads of people are feeling shit. How do you? Those difficult times. Do you have a trick? Do you have a thing? Of you? Do you look back on in, in hindsight and recognize something where you've gone? That's helped get me through it. Food. Food, really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lad, I swear to God, you should have seen how fat I went that weekend. Literally, just <laughs> that that one weekend. Luckily oh, enough, man. I've got I've got a good set of mates around me, lad. I've got a good yeah. gym, good teammates. Um, I've got a brilliant family and fiance who were there to support me 24-7, know what I mean? If it, if it wasn't for them, I don't know where I'd be right now. Um, Are you good at but, talking about issues like that? Because, I mean, we're hearing this whole thing is it's okay not to be okay, and there's a big um, movement at the moment to get men talking about, you know, opening up to people, don't bottle it up, you know, male suicide rates are very high. Uh, and, yeah, I, I, I don't even know exactly where I'm going with that. It just seems so... I, I, I had to learn to, to speak about it because, like yeah. I said, when I fought back, I was just crying to myself and I wasn't speaking to anyone about it and I was just yeah. bottling everything up. I was too embarrassed, you know what I mean? I was too embarrassed to go and speak to my missus about it or speak to my mum and dad or 
even any of my mates, you know what I mean? I was thinking, like, like as you do, as everyone else thinks, I'm a fighter. I, yeah. I shouldn't feel like this, you know what I mean? I, I'm People look up to me as a, as a tough dude who should be able to fight through all this, but I'll be honest, when I did, it, it's weird, you know, the way people say, get it off your chest. Yeah. It genuinely does work. Like, you feel a weight come off your shoulders when you speak to someone. It's like, wow, that's mad. Like, you start talking to someone and like it's like a burden's being took off you. It, it's 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 mad. It's it's hard to explain, but like I am a big advocate for that now. Like I'm doing a skydive in May for the Men Matter organization. Oh, uh, brilliant! Well done, mate. Uh, over the past year, obviously, as you know, with COVID and stuff, a lot a lot of people who I know have been affected by male suicide, and it's something that isn't spoke about enough. So. A lot. I I can never put on a post up saying anyone needs to speak. Just message me. Like you don't need, you don't need to go and speak to anyone if you don't want to be embarrassed. Just message me. And I got a lot of messages about it, and people were were, were happy to talk to me. And it like it made me feel good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Made me feel brilliant. But like over the past few months, there's been a few people who are now even like my mum's cousin, uh, John. He hung himself, lad, and he's got two young kids. Like. It's, I'm really sorry to it, hear that, mate. It's right. crazy what's going on in the world, and people think that, you know, it's e- it's mad. People think it's easier to kill yourself than it is to go and speak to someone who you know. Like I always say to people who get on me and speak to me, and they say, "Oh, you helped me get through this." I always say to them, lad, people would rather you talk to them about your problems than be stood at your funeral crying their eyes out. Yeah, you you need to speak to someone about it, someone close to you. You need to let them know because. They'll give you that support net that you need. Uh, like any of my mates need any support like that, I'm always there for them. Just like I know my mates would be there for me. It's it's just something that like men need to talk more. Women are different. You know, women will sit there and talk about anything, lad. They'll sit there and talk about anything all day long, lad. They'll tell each other all the problems. But we'll sit there and talk about footy and fighting and yeah. stuff what's on the telly. Know what I mean? We won't sit there and talk about our actual feelings, and it's that stigma around men what needs sorting, and that's something that I I want to help sort out. Because a lot of people look at me and think, "Oh, he's a fighter. He's a tough guy. He shouldn't. He shouldn't feel like that. He shouldn't." But I do. I feel like that all the time. Sometimes, like especially after I've lost fights and stuff around me is going wrong all the time. Like that when that Giannetti fight that was meant to happen. Obviously, I hadn't fought for over a year, and then that happened, and I thought, oh, my God, this is just not meant to be. And then again, I was meant to fight in the March. COVID come about. My opponent pull, got pulled out on nine days' notice because Italy went into lockdown. I was sitting in my room again, just like, this is not meant to be, crying my eyes out. And then again, a couple of months ago, when I got told you've got to have another hand surgery on my good hand, it's like, what's going on here? But I've come through the tunnel at the other side and I feel on top of the world now. Like, I, you've got to, I think in life now, I've realised that you've got to go as low as you can go to be getting up to as high as you can get. And I, I'm going to break through the fucking ceiling, lad, trust me. Were well, you going to do that, do mate? Because you're throwing yourself out of an aeroplane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in regards to that, Paddy, is there like, is it a sponsor thing? Can, if we, can we share the link and get it out there and yeah, get people yeah, sponsoring? Yeah, I've got, I've got the link in my bio on, um, oh, on Instagram. You know, it's yeah. a Men Matter organisation. It's it's a big, it's a big thing. It's a nice cause. And it's, I, like I say, it's close to my heart. Um, in Liverpool, there's been quite a few people who are not even much older than me and around my age killing themselves. And it's just, it's sad to see because, you know, I, I lost two uncles when I was younger and it, it killed me, man. You know what I mean? It, like, they never killed themselves. You know what I mean? But just a, a mother should never have to bury the son. Yeah. Ever. It just should not work like that. So I, I know that it's it's not just killing men. It's killing families and it's killing mothers and fathers. And it, it just, it, the stigma around it needs sorting. Men just need to speak more. Like I say, as soon as I spoke and got it off my chest, that saying, just get it off your chest, is it's real. It's so real. 
Well, we'll definitely try and help you out as much as possible on the socials of all that, mate. I think you're doing a fantastic thing there. And that's one of the things that we want to do with this as well is, you know, I I hate this kind of misconception of mixed martial arts being this kind of barbaric sport full of brutes. No, it's just real people that are kind of martial artists doing this amazing sport. Yes, it, it can be brutal at times, but the people in it aren't brutes. They are just good, genuine people trying to, do good in the world and, and I think you're doing a fantastic thing mate well done yeah that's it lad. We're, we're normal men that's what we are we're normal when we've just got to drive to do something and like as you say people think I'm amazed barbaric lad it's so technical and there's so yeah. many different details involved like people look at used to look at boxing as it's barbaric but now everyone thinks it's technical and it's all this yeah. and that lad, we have to do nice. like boxing and four or five other sports yeah and cram it all in and people think ours is barbaric oh lad it's crazy I mean that is one go on Stu you go oh no I'm just I'm just interested whilst we're talking about sort of uh, you know mental strength and 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 and, and dealing with you know difficulties I'm always fascinated to know how you how you deal with the thought of walking out into an arena in Liverpool, knowing that there's a weight of responsibility or no weight of expectation from, from the fans. They're all waiting to see you do your thing. And I mean, I presume you train for an extra round just for your fucking ring walk. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, to be honest, um, like that's one of the reasons why I, like I said, I went into that fight with a broken hand against Bach. It can work good and bad because when I fought Bach, I shouldn't have done that fight. My hand was still terrible and I'd done it just because it was in front of my home city. If that was in a different city, I wouldn't have done it. But everyone that was buying tickets was coming to watch me. Everyone was coming to watch me and the whole show rested on my shoulders. So in that sense, it works in a bad way because it didn't pull out for that reason and ended up losing a 5-5 five, five, uh, five, five fight, 5-5 five, five minute round fight. Mm. But then at the same time, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Not like yeah. w- walking out in that crowd and the crowd going bananas is unbelievable. Like, you don't understand it. It's, as I always say it on podcasts and stuff, Vegas, New York, give me Liverpool any day I'm going to sell Anfield out in the coming years and that is going to be special that is going to be where it's happening when I sell Anfield out In regards to uh, I mean well, well, let's, let's let's take it back a little bit so I, I just want to because we're seeing British MMA now you know it's, it's on the world pla- you know it's on the world stage now and you know we've got world champs and it's it's, it's becoming it's one of the fastest growing sports, if not the fastest growing sport on the planet. Um, and I just want to know, Blake touched on something earlier about not not being very good with confrontation. And so I, I wonder like, what got you into it? Was there a moment, you know, was you a scrapper or was you just somebody that learned a combat sport? And like, had, had, what was your sort of way into it, first of all? Um, well, I wasn't really a scrapper, I don't know what I mean. It's, me, me and my brother used to fight all the time when we was little. I was He's five years older than me, so I could take a beating from a young age. Um, <laughs> I had I had a few fights in year seven, lad. That was about it. But I always used to headlock people, so it way it, it ended up coming full circle. Because I watched the I watched the um, Diego Sanchez versus Clay Guida. That was one of the first MMA fights I watched, and I was like, "This is brilliant. This is boss." A lad who I know who lives around the corner, Kyle Wilson, who's in a band now. Funnily enough got his own band, the Sonder. He introduced me to MMA. And then the first live event I watched was Rich Franklin versus Vitor Belfort. Oh. And um, obviously Belfort knocked him out dead quick. And again, I was like, ah, this is unbelievable. I went for a jog at half six in the morning after that finished. And um, two weeks later, 20th of January, 2010, I know the date, I went to Next Generation. And um, I walked in and I, I was just like, I got called a natural straight away when it comes to jujitsu. You know what I mean? I was, I'm flexible. Um, I'm, I'm like, I'm very bendy. I can get me, me legs and in, into positions most of the people can't. 
And then, like, for I was only small. I was only, like, 55 kilo when I first joined. But I could use my weight as well. Uh, I was good on top of people as well as on the bottom. So, at first, I got into the jiu-jitsu and I started winning a few comps. And then I was doing my striking as well. And I ended up getting extended study leave in school. And I was in the, in the morning classes in the gym for about a week. And one of the one of the lads, Aaron, pulled out of his fight. And um, he pulled out of a fight against a, a lad called Keaton O'Brien, who was 24 at the time. I was 16. And um, like Paul said to me, do you want to take this fight? And I was like, yeah, definitely. I'll take this fight, 100%. <laughs> and he went, uh, so I'll come in and do rounds on Friday. So I went in the gym, done the rounds, and he said, do you want to take the fight? And he previously beat another one of the lads from the gym, Matty, so uh, who was a bit older than me. So like everyone thought I was I was gonna get beat. No, I was only sixteen. This fella was twenty four, and I just went in and wrestled him. I just put him on his back, stayed on top of him, and I won the fight by decision. And then it just it just went from there. Know what I mean? I had I had nine amateur fights in a year, and I won every single one of them. Um, I got a reputation as the best amateur at my weight in the country, and then there was no amateur fights left for me. So I went pro at seventeen. Uh, went 3-0 and nice and quick and got signed to Cage Warriors at the age of 18 and again in my me, me Cage Warriors debut I fought someone who was like 30 something his name was Callum Florian he was a wrestler and he, he'd sparred one of the better lads from our gym a couple of months before and done a number on him and everyone in the MMA world was like oh, this, this young lad's going to get beat up by this Callum Florian and again done three fives with him and it was a round each going into the third and I swept them and got on top and took us back and punched them until the end of the fight and I won that one by decision. And from then on, it just it just went on from there. You know what I mean? I was I was the young kid who was on the scene and I started getting called a prospect from that moment on. So the, you you mentioned a couple of like big names already in like Vitor Belfort and Rich Franklin Franklin and stuff. Do you have anyone that either when you were long, younger or whatever that you, you looked up to and wanted to maybe emulate them a little bit? Because when I look at your, I mean, again, I'm speaking from an uneducated position as like a couch fan. I don't know the technicalities <laughs> of it all, but you just seem like there's this weird merging of like it being quite chaotic and yet really technical. Like when I'm seeing you kind of strike and then jump into a like a flying triangle or something like that, I'm like, it's like a Tasmanian devil's just gone in there, but this Tasmanian <laughs> devil really knows his stuff and he's really technical. I just, I don't know what's going on. I, I, but it's so exciting to watch. Like, it, was there anyone that you went, oh, I want to be a bit like him or I want to take a bit of that person's game with a bit of that person's game or anything like that? Well, there was there was one person that when I was younger, I looked up to and it was Big Nog, um, Minotaro right. Nogueira. Yeah, just because he could take a beating off anybody, and he'd just keep going and keep going, and he'd catch it in a submission or he'd, he'd he'd catch it with something. That's what I like to think I'm like. Like, I'll never quit. I'll never stop. You'd have to put me asleep or snap yeah. me arm if you want to beat me. You know what I mean? Like, I think my biggest uh, attribute is my heart and my desire. I, I I won't stop. It's that simple. You can put me in as many bad positions as you want, but I'll keep going and I'll keep going and I'll keep going. And that's why that's where I think I got from Big Nog. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I do. He, he's probably, the way people say heroes and stuff, he's like, when I was younger, he's who I used to watch all the time. And I, I used to like want to be like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But obviously, now as I've got older, I have, I've got my own style. Um, no one's the break that my last fight against Decky Dalton I wanted to showcase my new striking but I couldn't because he well he, th he threw a kick he ended up falling over and that was it you know what I mean I was on top of him yeah. and the fight the fight was over two minutes later but again I've levelled up so much over the past year to a point where I, I am a different fighter again and I'm going to show that next week when I fight people are going to get a, a, an absolute shock when I come out there and start laying hands and kicks and knees and elbows on this poor bastard. And the thing is as well, there'll be a lot of people watching that, Paddy, because you, you, you touched on like, you know, one of your biggest attributes is your heart. You also touched upon the fact that, you know, at a very young age, you was a prospect. There's lots of prospects at a young age and, and lots of them have, you know, successful careers. 
you've done that, but you've also done the thing that's the really difficult thing. You've become a fan favorite. You've got a following that most fighters will give their right arm for. And like, what do you put that down to a kind of a bit of everything that maybe I've just mentioned there? Like, what, why do you think that everybody has just got behind you and loves you as a fighter? Um, that's, well, to be honest, lad, I'm like my mate. Like, I always say you either love me or you hate me, but you watch me fight. Yeah. You know what I mean? A lot of people don't like me just because of how brash I am and the way I am, but I'm not one of them who puts on a, an act. Everything you see with me is what you get. You see me on a camera, I'm the exact same in the gym, you know what I mean, or on the street or anything like that. That This is just me. I don't like people who put personas on and act like something different for the camera. That irritates me. Um, I think they're fake bastards. But, like, what you see is what you get with me, the charisma and everything. That, that's just the way I am in everyday life. I can't help it. Uh, and my personality just draws people to me. Exactly like I said before, whether some people hate me and some people love me. But no matter what, they all want to see me fight. Whether you want to see me win or you want to see me get knocked out, everyone tunes in when I fight. Know what I mean? Like when you watch a cage warriors show, like when I fought in the Echo Arena, when I won the belt, I was co-main event, and everyone's like all my family and my mates were like, "Lad, you should have seen it after you walked off." It was like the board had just been put up at Anfield. Everyone was just walking out. Know what I mean? Wow. People weren't staying for the main event. People were just getting off. My brother was like, "Lad, I was still in the arena, sparking a biff, the lad, because everyone was just walking out." <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Is, so Stu brings up like this amazing following you have and uh, you know I suppose in some ways as well you kind of you slightly have to cultivate that on, on social media a little bit and I, I I'm not a fan of Twitter I, 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 I we, we had Brad, Brad Pickett on the other week and it, you know we, we both had a little chat about you know the the way that Twitter has kind of made the world effectively. We're trying to put the world to rights and talk about the negativities of Twitter. You seem to really hit back at the haters on Twitter. You don't just kind of, like I, I personally would just go, oh, I'm just going to press the mute button on you because you're an idiot and I don't want to engage. But you seem to really go back at them. Like, What is it that makes you go, no, I'm actually going to come back at you for that rather than just kind of discarding them as idiots? I think it's just because of the city I'm from, lad. Liverpool. Yeah. We don't let anyone say anything to us. You've got to say something back. You know what I mean? If someone said something to me on the street here, I'd turn around and go, what? You divvy. And like, yeah. I, I half feel the same way on Twitter. I, I shouldn't to most of them, especially troll accounts where they know they're fake and they're just absolutely talking pony. They're not, they're not saying anything with substance. They're just trying to wind me up. Most of the time, I should just blank them and block them, but I don't block anyone. I feel like I've lost if I block someone. You know right. what I mean? Like, yeah. I have to give back, even when it is a fake account. And most of the time, I do well, as you know. Most of the time, I'll put yeah. them in the book. But Twitter is, like, it's an annoying one, Twitter, because there's that many troll accounts and fake accounts. And yeah. I've seen a petition the other day. I shared it myself, a petition to the, um, you have to have, like, your ID on your Twitter account. Yeah. Like, I think that's a perfect idea, like an ID or I agree. A, bank, a bank card on your Twitter account because there's that many idiots what make accounts nowadays and they just spout hate and they just yep. want to bring people down. And that brings us back to the men matter thing before. Yep. Like, pe people do actually get very affected by stuff people say on social media. And other people say, oh, no, it's only social media. Social media is still real life. You're still mm -hmm. saying something to someone. People think now because you're behind the keyboard that it's not real. It is. If you say something about my family to me behind the keyboard and I bump into you, I'll still punch your face in. Just because it's behind the keyboard, it doesn't make a difference. Like if you if you haven't got the balls to say it's it's someone's face in person, don't put it on Twitter. Simple as that. Simple as Simple that. Simple as that. Yeah, I, I feel like I, I need to point out as well that most of the people that did grow up in Peckham where I grew up would give it back, but I was too busy as a teenager just playing like Star Wars role-play games, <laughs> uh, you know, and not really going outside much. I was a very, very pale child for not getting any vitamin D because I was too yeah, busy playing, we, playing we Xbox. Grew up, 
we grew, we grew up on Call of Duty 4 and Call of Duty Modern <laughs> Warfare, lad. We was always beefing in lobbies. Ah, what are you saying? Ah. Constant fear, the lad, just arguing. So, looking uh, ahead to the to the scrap, uh, how are you feeling? Everything good? Yeah, lad, everything's brilliant. I've had a brilliant fight camp, you know what I mean? Um, a, a brilliant fight camp, though. Like, my s and has been on point, my nutrition, all my sparring, all my sessions. Like I said, I've where I haven't fought in a year, even though I've had surgery, I've, I've levelled up so much. Uh, for a couple of months, I couldn't grapple because of my hand. So all I've done was box. And my boxing's just come on tenfold. Um, I've been training with me, me boxing coach, Chris Williams, in his new gym, the no-name gym, lad, with um, Brandon Dayord and Liam Moon, who are two up-and-coming pros who are going to do big things. And just being around professional boxers every day and seeing their mannerisms, what they do when they train, it's it's a different, it's a different sense to... Uh, and an age you know what I mean it's it's just different I, I can't really put me put my finger on it it's just different know what I mean and then I was being going to boxing gyms like the Solly and Spad and stuff like that and it's just different you, I, and I've felt me boxing come on so much and me striking and me footwork and I, like I say I can't wait to put on a show for everyone like everyone just thinks I'm a grappler and that I've got no striking and everyone's going to see a completely different version of me next week and I'm going to sign off from Cage Warriors on a masterpiece. It's going to be a Vincent Van Gogh-esque. <laughs> and not, not wanting to sort of look past your opponent um, next weekend, what, what, what is the sort of the bigger picture? Where, where are you looking, Paddy? I'm going to be one of the biggest stars in the world. I, I am. It's me. I know it's me destiny. You know what I mean? I, I always put a post up, lad, if people don't laugh at your dreams, then they're not big enough. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I put that up the other week and someone, a troll account, a troll account yeah. on Twitter, messaged me back with laughing faces saying, okay, mate. So we just shared that again and put, this is exactly what I'm getting at. You know what I mean? If people don't laugh at what you're saying you're going to do in life, then th- you're not dreaming big enough. And, lad, I- I'm... My plan is to emulate Conor McGregor, do what he's done. You know what I mean? That that is the plan. That is what I'm gonna do. But I'm gonna have more longevity in the sport. I'll be do. I'll be continue to fight and fight and fight. I'm really glad to hear that everything's going well with this training camp as well. Because I did see. I think you said post the Julian Arosa fight, if I'm getting that one right, that you cut 18 pounds overnight for that fight. I don't know. Yeah. How is that humanly possible? Because I said this to Stu earlier and he was like, are you fucking kidding me? Because yeah, like, well, yeah. And I, I talked to my wife as well, because, you know, yeah, well, we're like, oh, we have a little workout, but then we'll have a Chinese and we, you know, eat the cupcakes and all this stuff. And then we'll look and we'll go, oh, I could look a bit better and all this stuff. And then I'll say, this fighter just cut 18 pounds overnight. And we're like, how is that humanly possible? <laughs> also, like to do something like that, must have had an effect on you either during the fight or just after the fight because that that just sounds insane. Eighteen pounds overnight. I've I've done a few ridiculous cuts to be honest. When I won the belt, I cut seven and a half key overnight. When I fought Julian Arosa, I found out about that fight four weeks before it when I was in a cave rave in Wales. <laughs> um, my mate rang me who was watching Cage. What are you? Oh, you fighting this kid off the Ultimate Fighter? I was like, that. Am I? Yeah. So. And I was weighing, at the time, I was weighing 86 key, and I had to make 66. Um, I got, I remember the week, the week of that fight, I woke up 78 kilo on the Monday, and I had to weigh 66. And then the day before the weigh-in, I woke up at 74 kilo, and I had to weigh, obviously, 65.8 the next day. Like, that that one, I was getting pulled in and out the sauna by my coach. Like, I couldn't, like, physically pick myself up I was getting pulled in and out of a sauna um, and was that the technique it's, it's it's all in the sauna was there anything else because it no, just sounds baths. mad to me it was hot baths, baths, but uh, I didn't make weight on time so we had to go to a sauna with the two hours that we had left yes yeah so where Gianetti wouldn't go and get in a sauna for two hours I went and got yeah. in a sauna for two hours and made weight um, and then that was the worst one I, I was as you know I vomited in the cage after that fight where my body just, like, the last two rounds of that fight, I just survived. I won the first three rounds, 
And then in between the third and the fourth, I turned to Paul and Alison was just like, listen, I can't feel my body. Like, yeah. my arms are dead. I had to just survive for two rounds. And then I fought Nad Naramani a couple of months later. And as I said, at the, around that time, I was 21, 22. I was so unprofessional. I was going out partying to, to like, Saturday, Sunday, having, like, three hours kip and going to the gym and training on Monday morning. I was just eating shit. My diet would only start, like, five, six weeks out. Um, when I'd done that Nad Naramani fight, I cut 7.7 kilo overnight. And, um... Like that time when I was dry, I went and got a DEXA scan in the university. And uh, I didn't find out the results till a few months later. But if I would have cut another 0.2 kilo that day, I would have had kidney failure. Oh my God. And I had the testosterone in my body of a 12 year old boy. That's what I have normally, to be fair. And the next. That's normal for me. The next night, I done 25 minute fights. I went five, five minute rounds. Wow. Like I ended up with gastroenteritis and all that off that weight cut. You wanted Jesus. to smell me, you wanted to smell me bare plaid in the changing rooms before the fourth. <laughs> just smelt like egg. It was disgusting, lad. People were going to me. If you just farted, I'm like, no, lad, that's a bit. Oh like, man. Uh, I, I have do you think that was a blood. big do you think that was a big learning? Uh like a big lesson for you that like since then you're like, well, now I definitely yeah. know I need to do it this way. Yeah, I had a couple of health scares because of it, know what I mean? I had to like pull out of other fights and stuff where I had health scares because of them weight cuts. So like I've like I've said in before, I've done so much growing up over the past few years. Like now now I'm fighting at the weight above and I woke up this morning seventy four point two kilo. Yeah. Where like I've still got five days to make weight. I've got four key to lose and when I woke up the morning before the Julia Rosa fight, the morning before I was eight kilo overweight. Wow! I woke up. I woke up the same weight as I did this morning, but the day before when I fought Julia Rosa, and that was ten pounds lighter the weight the weight division. That's nuts. I'm I'm glad you brought up the uh, the throwing up because when you like start googling Paddy Pimblet, one video that comes up says, <laughs> "Oh." Cage fighter throws up blood after fight, but then when you do a little bit of digging, you hear see something about no, uh, thank you. You hit see uh, like a quote or something from you saying, Thanks very much for the concern, but it wasn't blood, it was hot chocolate and Ferrero Rocher. Is that is that accurate? <laughs> just just shows how unprofessional I was. Didn't it? <laughs> Literally, if your I'd family's thought, anything like mine, I'd, you'd be getting cases of Ferrero Rocher sent to you <laughs> constantly now. Eight eight point four <laughs> kilo overnight, and then before the coach left to go to the BT Sports venue, me and Adam Vensey went to Starbucks, and I don't like coffee. You know what I mean? He got, he got he was I don't I I was just going for a walk, and I ended up going oh hot chocolate I get hot chocolate. <laughs> And obviously we walked past the Tesco and I got a few Ferrero Rocher and I shouldn't have known what I mean. This was at like, say, five, six o'clock and I fought at about half, nine, ten. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, it just shows how much of a fucking idiot I was. You know what I mean? Adam said to me, what are you doing? Don't do that. And I just didn't, at the time, I didn't listen to anyone. You know what I mean? I knew best. No one could oh. tell me any difference. I was the world champion. I was 21. I'd got where I was because of me at that time. You didn't realise that it was everyone around me where it got to where I am and listening to them had helped me. Like, I was just, no, no, I'm right. I can do this. It's me. It's up to me. You know what I mean? It's my life. It's my decisions. And that's where I, I made up that when the UFC originally offered me to sign, I, I never took it because I was just reckless and stupid. And I would have ended up getting beat up by some fully grown man in the UFC after fucking eating four whisper golds two hours before the fourth. <laughs> <laughs> was that part of that decision making? Because in a weird way, that's an incredibly clever thing for a, a young man to think, do you know what? This amazing opportunity has come in for me, but I in myself know that I'm not mature enough for it yet. That's an incredibly clever thing, forward thinking thing to think. Well, it, was, it wasn't just that, to be honest. It was like my coach, obviously, and my dad and stuff. But Cade Warriors come in with a spectacular offer. You know what I mean? Like, they did. They come in with a brilliant offer where it was too good to turn down. So I took the, I took that was another reason. Like, obviously, there was the fact that. 
I was very young to go to the UFC. I was 21 years of age. I've literally only just become a man over the past year or two and grew into my body. Like, back then, I was a skinny little whippet. Like, I didn't even do any strength and conditioning then when I won the belt. When I won the belt, I just done MMA training. That's all I've done. I've never done any sort of strength and conditioning or looked after my nutrition, as you know. <laughs> no, so, like, it was a very good, very good decision in hindsight. Now I know when I do sign, like, like I say, I think I'm going to win this fight in the first round, get a spectacular finish, and I'll sign for the UFC. And it will have, have, have helped me tenfold the fact that I never went when I got offered originally. And I'm going to make a statement when I do land in the UFC. You know what I mean? One interview, yeah. lad. One interview, and everybody will know Paddy the Baddy. You'll love me or you'll hate me off the first interview, but you'll want to see me fight. Um, I'm I, sure. I don't doubt that at all, mate. I don't yeah. doubt that at all. We're, we're, we're on the paddy train already, mate. We're, we're, we're all over it, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, looking ahead, like, you know, uh, if people want to kind of keep up to speed, I'm just mindful that we're fast approaching the hour, Mark, now. We, we don't want to sort of take up too much of your time. If people want to kind of keep up to speed with everything that's happening in the world of paddy, where's the, the, the best place for people to sort of keep up to speed with what you're up to, mate? Um, Instagram, to be honest, Instagram, um, at Paddy the Baddy, I have a Facebook page as well, but Facebook's dying out, as everyone knows, yeah. um, and Twitter, but if you go on Twitter, you'll probably just see me having it with people. <laughs> <laughs> well, to all the trolls out there, just go to Paddy on Twitter, he, he loves a troll. <laughs> yeah, I'll put I'll, I'll any troll in the place, but yeah, I'm, I'm always active on my Instagram, know what I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always active on it. Anyone that wants to see a lot of lovely food after a fort get on my Instagram you know I've got I've got cookie pies donuts cake <laughs> all, they're all coming after me fight the week after me fight I have a food diaries on my story that sounds awesome man Paddy I firstly thank you so much for your time like, it's been, more uh... than welcome man more than welcome when I get signed lad if you just want me back on don't you worry I'll be back Oh, oh, you're mate. a legend, mate. Absolutely, and, uh, mate. Any fans out there, it's uh, Paddy the Baddy fighting David Martinez at Cage Warriors 122 on March 20th. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, a year to the day of my last fight. Love, Perfect. Love, Come mate. full circle. The first round finish live on UFC Fight Pass. Can't wait to see it, mate. Can't wait to see it. Paddy, thank you so much, my friend. All the best, Paddy. You're you more than welcome. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. No, it's our pleasure, mate. Thank you. Christy.